Hi everyone and welcome to another video by BioTeach London. Thank you so much for joining me on this video which is focused on giving you an overview of what to expect for Unit 6 Assignment C and D. Don't forget that I've posted learning aims A and B already and I've got a link that's just flashed up on your screen now which will take you to the playlist for all the Unit 6 videos that I've created. So learning aims C and D are to safely undertake the experimental project, collect and analyse data and to finally review the project. For this assignment the distinction is what I'm going to discuss. If you miss any key points in your work, your grade will drop to a merit and an even briefer submission of your work will get you a pass. So it's much easier to aim for the distinction and make a checklist of all the things that you need to include in your work. For the distinction standard, you're required to review the information that you've obtained from your research and practical work and decide on its validity, reliability, accuracy, and whether the original hypothesis of your work has been met. You should include an evaluation of alternative experimental approaches, the modification or rewriting of any of the hypotheses that you made, as well as the strengths and weaknesses of your uh, approach that you made towards your experiment. You will also evaluate the effectiveness of the choice of the statistical method that you've chosen or any graphs or calculations that you've made and the validity and the usefulness of the research data as well as considering how the experimental data that you've got compares to any published information and discussing any limitations of your project. The idea for this assignment is it will ask you to draw on all of the areas of your project work that you've carried out and basically reflect on the strengths and the weaknesses of your own performance and the skills that you've developed, as well as drawing on feedback that you've got from your teachers. Teachers are looking for you to be able to demonstrate how self-reflection and feedback, which can be through working together with your teacher, has aided your project work. And also, as part of this, you will suggest areas of improvement and the steps that are necessary to achieve those areas of improvement. Now, you're probably thinking, wow, that sounds like quite a lot to do. It is a really large assignment that you will need to submit for learning AMC and D together. I just thought it'd be useful to have a breakdown of what's needed in the report first, and then a checklist of the things that you've got to have in your work to achieve the grades that you need. So let's go through the structure of the report first. The first thing that you would need to have is a title. Seems really obvious, but you'd be surprised how many students forget to put this in. The purpose of the title really is to basically sum up your work in a single phrase or a sentence and it needs to be very clear, specific and brief. Its meaning should be fairly obvious to most of the readers. So an example of a good title would be something like artificial light helps to grow crops at a faster rate if you're looking at say for example photosynthesis experiment or if you're looking at the effect of caffeine for example, caffeine has significant effects on reaction times. It could also be a title that says it's an investigation into and then you say what your investigation is. But just make sure it's super, super clear. The next part of your report is the abstract or the summary. Now, the purpose of the abstract or the summary is to basically give the reader a summary of the entire report for very quick reading. It should include your reasons for doing the work, your methods, your findings and your conclusions. And it needs to be fairly interesting and easy to read. The whole point of the abstract or the summary is that it's fairly independent from the rest of the report. It's almost like a mini report, which needs to make sense completely on its own. References must not be included in the abstract or the summary and nothing should appear in the abstract that is not in the rest of the report itself and it's usually around 200 or 300 words and you usually write in the past tense in one single paragraph. Most students find it easier to write the summary or the abstract right at the end after they've done their entire report so just be aware of that. The introduction is really there to state the research problem that you've identified. It's there to establish your hypothesis, to provide justification and state any methods that you've used, and a little bit about the results and the conclusion. So the whole point is that you talk about your research objectives clearly and simply. You may want to define your work and state why it's distinctive, if it is. You should include a clear statement of what your hypothesis is which states what you expect to happen as part of your experiment. 
And you might just want to give a bit of a current background on the information of the research problem. The next section, which is looking at materials and methods, we're really just talking about providing an extensive protocol or standard operating procedure for your experiment, which can be repeated by others. This is like an instruction manual, and it's, it's allowing the reader to basically do the experiment themselves if they need to. So you should have details of experimental design. You may have photographs of your apparatus set up if you think that's appropriate, or you can have hand-drawn diagrams, something similar like that. You would put in the information about the details of the controls that you've used and what their purpose was, details of any data recording techniques. So if you've collected gas or you've counted bubbles or you've measured the height of a plant that it's grown, whatever it might be. And you should have exact quantities and purities of any reagents that you may have used. If your apparatus has any technical specifications, then you should include that in there. And if you've created any sort of dilutions of stock solutions, then that should also be in there as well. So any specific methods of sample preparation. The next thing that I think I would include as part of this section is to maybe talk about if you've had any subjects in the study. So say, for example, you've used um, human subjects in a caffeine experiment, then you should talk about their age, their general health, give information about that. And you should also give any overall information about how you sampled if you did any sampling methods. The next part of it after the materials and the methods is looking at the results. The purpose of the results section is really to present your data in a manner that's easy to understand and to read and to interpret. So this is where the core of your work is going to be presented, your experimental data. So being clear in this particular area is really, really essential because the rest of your report basically hinges on what's going on in the results section. It should be kept fairly brief and you shouldn't really talk about any sort of methods or repetition of results or anything like that. But you should look at things like the relationship between your data and um, put that in some form of paragraph as part of your results. Your results section may have subheadings if you think it um, appropriate. And you should present all your raw data as well as your uh, process data. Some teachers might advise you to present your raw data as part of the appendix. So just be aware of that. I haven't put that in this video, but usually my students don't have uh, reams and reams of raw data. So they're able to just put that straight into their results section. In the results section, you need to include any tables, any graphs, any figures, and make sure that they're labelled and they're, you describe exactly what it is that they're showing. The part after the results is the discussion. The purpose of this is to basically discuss the relationships between your results and how they relate to your hypothesis. You should describe the shortcomings and the implications of your work here. You should also provide any major conclusions and provide support um, with evidence of that. And you may also want to talk about your future applications. So of what you found, what are the future applications? You do not need to repeat the results again. You simply just talk about how your results um, are related to your hypothesis and what your results mean. So find a good explanation for your results and put that in your discussion. Talk about how similar your results are to the research that you did as part of your literature review. And if they aren't similar, then discuss that as well. Don't feel tempted to make your results fit. If you've got completely different results to what you expected, then say that. That's kind of what science is about. It's about making mistakes. It's about addressing how those mistakes are made and then moving forward with the research that way. So be clear about what you found. Don't feel the need to make your results fit. And if you can't find a good explanation for your results, then state that you you haven't got an explanation for the results and what you would do next. The last section is looking at the references. The point of the references is to basically acknowledge any sources of information to avoid things like plagiarism and also to help strengthen any arguments that you might have had. So every piece of information that you've got in the report that isn't your own information needs to be referenced. So anything that isn't your original data, anything that might have been peer reviewed, any information like that. So just make sure you Harvard reference it because that's usually the way that we um, reference appropriately in our assignments. So for this part of the video, I wanted to go through what the teacher could be looking for when they mark your work. 
Now, for learning aim C, they're mainly kind of observing you carry out your experiments. So they'll look at whether you have set up the apparatus correctly, how safely you carried out the practical. You may also wish to let your teachers know if you've made any changes to the method or the apparatus, and also to note this down in your logbook as well. Remember I talked about the logbook in learning aims B, where you have to write down, almost treat it like a journal, and write down everything that you do. So that needs to continue throughout learning aim C practical. Your teacher will check your logbook when you hand in all of your work, but they'll also expect to see it during every single practical activity. Make sure you bear in mind what your original hypothesis was as well. Again, this should be in your logbook. When you do your experiment, are you finding that the hypothesis has been met? If so, then state that in the notes in your logbook or any conversation that you might have with your teacher. This allows them to see whether you're on the right track or not. For learning aim D, you will then write that report that I discussed earlier in this video, but you will have to include the information that I've discussed as well. So anything that goes in your logbook can be summarized nicely in your report. For learning aim D, you're looking at which SATs test you're gonna carry out and why. Talk about overall conclusions, whether there are any ways to improve your methodology. Mention anything about how accurate your observations were and how you recorded your results. For example, when I was observing one of my students, um, they found it difficult to monitor the temperature um, on the hot plate because their hot plate had gotten too hot. So every time they left the beaker or the water bath on the hot plate, it exceeded the, their required temperature. So that's something that that student can put down in their discussion to say that the temperature regulation became slightly challenging and needed a lot more of their attention than they anticipated. So when we're thinking about your results, you may need to even justify how many decimal places you used in terms of your data collection. So you might might say that you use three decimal places initially and then you rounded your number to two decimal places or even one decimal place for accuracy. When you think back to your literature review, you should try and see whether your data fits in with any other data that's available from similar experiments. And this can be a point of discussion in your assignment as well. Talk about the significance of the data and whether you've met your aims. I would also talk about the reflection part of your assignment. So there's a huge reflective part to this particular assessment where you've got to talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of your method, but also your own performance. You should highlight the skills that you've learned and use feedback from teachers as well to then talk about which skills you've picked up on. You can talk about how your skills developed over time. So for example, you could talk about the skill of accurately measuring small volumes of reagents being used, or you could talk about mastering a technique such as making your own lawn cultures. All of the points that I've mentioned and what you can see on your screens can be written in rough in your logbook to give you a basic rough plan. And then later you transfer that information into your final report for learning aim D. So I hope that was really helpful for you all. Feel free to leave me any questions or any comments below this video if you've got any. Please remember in the description of this video, I have added the links to any other Unit 6 videos that I think you'll find useful. So make sure you check those out as well. Thank you so much for watching as always. Bye for now.